Hey everyone, welcome back to One Cent Sports Cards YouTube channel. I am excited to be bringing you a video about the 2021 card season. We've got 2021 Tops Series 1 coming out in just a few weeks. And the question that's on every collector's minds is who should I be collecting? Who are the big rookies? Who should I be going after? What are the good investments? All sorts of questions like that. Well, I'm taking some of the guesswork out for you as I have compiled a list of eight rookies that you should be targeting in 2021 Top Series 1. And as an added bonus, I'm going to give you two rookies that I think you should be avoiding. So, without further ado, let's jump right in and dissect Top's 2021 Series 1. All right, so with Topps 2021 Series 1 right around the corner, we've got eight rookies that we're going to target, and I'm going to give you two to avoid. Now, this will all be based on stats. This collecting advice is not based on speculation. It is not based on the cards that I want you to buy. They are all based on stats. So how did I develop this list? Well, first of all, all of the players that are on the list are either confirmed or very likely to have rookie cards in 2021 Top Series 1. Because the checklist isn't out, I can't guarantee that every one of these people will be on here, but I believe the vast majority of them will be. Most of them have been confirmed, but as always, Tops is secretive about checklists until a few days before the release, so we will see how accurate I, I am. Second of all, Every pick that I have made must have some sort of significant stat or relevant or a relevant proof point to back up my pick. Not a lot of opinions here, not a lot of hype. So trying to stay out of the world of opinion-based speculation and in the world of fact-based speculation. Third, some players aren't going to qualify as rookies in 2021 because they did have service time in 2020. So although although Major League Baseball will not recognize them as a rookie in 2020, um, tops their rookie card will be a 2021 card. So my final criteria for how I develop this list. Um, the players are picked based upon rookie card value, increased potential that I see between the start of the season and the end of the season. So what that means is that is not based on what I believe the player's entire career is going to do. So when we look at these cards, it's cards that you would invest in at the beginning of the season. And then by the end of the season, I believe that the players on this list, their card values will have increased significantly. Do they stay that way in the long term of their careers? I don't know. I'm not speculating out that far. So without further ado, let's get into our first pick. And that is going to be Mr. Sixto Sanchez, the Marlins starting pitcher. Now for each of these players, I'm going to give you three reasons to believe. So for Sixto, the first thing is he was the most electrifying player on a Marlins team that did make the playoffs in 2020. They called him up in the middle of the season, and he became the player to watch on the Marlins. Second of all, he has an extensive minor league career. In five minor league seasons, he compiled a 258 ERA and a 102 whip. Those are all numbers that signify a top of the rotation ace he's done it over time he's been a fantastic picture uh, he has a 98 mile an hour fastball that he can control with pinpoint accuracy just a fantastic rare talent and then finally in 39 major league baseball innings he pitched to a 7.39 strikeouts per nine innings ratio and all of that was done during a playoff chase as the Marlins were playing every game like a playoff game last year trying to sneak their way into the playoffs. So he did it under a high pressure performance and that was right after a call up. I expect those numbers to improve in 2021 and if Sixto gets off to a fast start, it, even though he's a pitcher, expect a lot of people to be chasing Sixto um, throughout the 2021 season especially if the Marlins play up to the ability that they played to last year. So who is pick number two? 
kind of an obvious one here. Mr. Ryan Mountcastle, outfielder for the Baltimore Orioles. What are our three reasons to believe? Well, first of all, he bats in the middle of the order on a improving team in the Baltimore Orioles. I don't believe that they're going to compete this year, but I do think that they will be better. Um, and he is in a very hitter-friendly park, Camden Yards, uh, which should only help his numbers. He will, he'll be sitting right in the middle of that order with a lot of a young talent around him as well. So plenty of opportunities to get those counting stats up, which people in the hobby eat up. The other thing, he only had 30 strikeouts in 2020 over the course of about 126 at-bats. That's like a 10% strikeout ratio, which is unheard of from a rookie and most veterans in Major League Baseball these days. He's a very high contact hitter. Um, although he doesn't hit the ball extremely hard, he can spray to all uh he, to, to all areas of the field, and at the end of the day, that low strikeout ratio means that the average goes up, those RBIs come through, the runs come across, and he continues to put up those counting stats that are so valuable in the hobby. Third reason, um, if he had enough at-bats last year to qualify, he would have placed second in batting average in the entire major leagues in 2020. Now, I do expect that batting average to fall. His In his minor leagues, he's kind of just below a 300 hitter. So I expect him to hover more around what his statistical norm is, which is 300. But we're talking about a guy that is young. He's only got 128 at-bats at the major league level. He's already showing he's capable of hitting well over 300. Could be a special player in Ryan Mount uh, in Ryan Mountcastle. I expect him to be one of the most sought-after rookies in Tops 2021, but definitely a rookie that you should be getting because if he stays healthy, that card should increase in value throughout the 2021 season. My third player, Alec Bohm, the Phillies' third baseman. What are the three reasons to believe? Well, first of all, he finished tied for second in National League Rookie of the Year voting behind Devin Williams, who is a relief pitcher. Now, Devin Williams had an amazing season, not to take anything away from Devin Williams, but Alec Bohm has a much, much higher ceiling for long-term potential within this hobby. Um, so... Although he finished second without that amazing uh, season that he had, uh, that Devin Williams had from a relief pitching standpoint, uh, but ba Bohm would have been definitely far and away the NL Rookie of the Year. In 44 major league games that he played last year, he had a 400 on base percentage and a 338 batting average to boot, which was tied for fourth in the National League. And that was all done as a rookie. If he improves on those numbers, you could see monster things over in Philadelphia this season. Finally, he's a productive hitter. And what I mean by that, he hit 452 with runners in scoring position in 2020. 452. So that was best in the bigs. If he continues to hit in those clutch moments and get those productive hits, we talk about counting stats again. And you get those counting stats up. Uh, Alec Bohm going to be a fantastic, fantastic uh, corner infielder for the Phillies for years to come. And that rookie card is coming. It is verified in Series 1. So get on it now. Another one of the very highly sought after rookie cards that's going to be in Series 1. Our next player going to be Dylan Carlson, Cardinals outfielder. What are the three reasons to believe? Well... He got on a hot streak late last season um, where from September 18th all the way through the postseason, which covered about 15 games, so about two weeks, he had a 289 batting average, a 389 on base percentage, um, a 578 slugging, and 976 OPS. Um, those numbers, he started out kind of slow, but he figured it out, and by the time the postseason came, um, he was playing right in the middle of that Cardinals lineup and became kind of an integral member along with Paul Goldschmidt. Now, the other thing to look at is when we look at some of the advanced stats on Dylan Carlson, he could have been even better. He had a 28.9% hard hit plus sweet spot contact in 2020. 
That is fifth in the majors. The players ahead of him have all been in MVP consideration. So when you look at that, when you look at that stat, it's a very advanced stat, and I understand that most people don't get it. But here's all you need to know. All the four players above him, two of them have already won MVP, and in 2020, two of them were in MVP consideration. So if Dylan Carlson continues some of these advanced stats that you can take a look at, I believe that you will see him take a significant step forward in 2021. And don't forget, he was the Cardinals cleanup hitter during the 2021 playoffs, and he should see plenty of time there again in 2021 as the Cardinals have not added any significant large bats that would that would take him out of that spot. So you've got Paul, Paul Goldschmidt, Dylan Carlson, kind of the cornerstone of that lineup, and that's how much the Cardinals believe in him. So expect a lot of counting stats again for Dylan Carlson. Definitely someone maybe flying slightly under the radar, that you should totally be targeting in Series 1. Next, we have Mr. Cabrian Hayes of the Pirates. He is the third baseman. This is one card that I am... There is some speculation that they may hold Cabrian Hayes until Series 2. However, I'm going to put a gamble out there, and if he shows up in Series 1, if you're a collector slash investor, go ahead and pounce on uh, on Cabrian Hayes. Here's why. Three reasons to believe. First of all, in September last year, won the National League Rookie of the Year, a Rookie of the Month award by batting a paltry 376 with a 422 on base percentage and five home runs over the course of 24 games. Just was an absolute tear on a Pirates team that was out of contention. So showing that he belonged at the big league level, he is definitely going to be starting for them at the beginning of the season in 2021. Um, The Pirates are a rebuilding team. They have actually just traded away some more people um, in full-on rebuild mode, which doesn't bode well for the hype around the Pirates. However, getting a young nucleus in there, the one thing that that provides Hayes is plenty of leash to figure it out at the major league level. They don't have anyone behind them that they can put in that's going to be a better option than him, so they're going to give him time to learn. It's a low-pressure situation which I think Brian Hayes is going to thrive in that sort of situation. And then the other thing with him, um, there's a speed power combo um, along with that on base percentage that he's had over the course of five minor league seasons. Um, So he runs for speed. He can hit for a little bit of power, probably a 30 hole, a, a, a 30 stolen base 10 and maybe 10 to a dozen home runs a year. Um, But with that on base percentage, he gets on base a lot. He's got all the tools of what GMs are looking for in today's prototypical player. Uh, And don't forget last year, he had a 442 on base percentage in the majors. Do I expect it to stay that high? Of course not. But if he stays right around that 354 and can improve on that just a little bit, going to be a just an absolute dominant threat on the bases, going to be getting lots of hits, could potentially put himself in line to see some batting champion contention. So Cabrian Hayes, a very interesting player here. Don't expect a lot of power from him, but a little bit, which also falls into line with my next player, which is a little bit more of a sleeper. Um, Sleeper, maybe we call it a sleeper, maybe we don't, but my next player is going to be Andreas Jimenez, and he was recently traded to the Indians in the Francisco Lindor trade. I wouldn't have had him on here if he was still on the Mets. However, his situation changes now that he is in Cleveland. So here's three reasons to believe. The very first thing is for the Mets, he was batting ninth in the lineup, which does not provide a lot of opportunity for those running stats. You actually end up with about 40, 50, 60 less at bats over the course of a season batting in the nine hole versus the one hole. Uh, but at, for the Indians, he projects as their leadoff hitter. So a lot more at bats, a lot more chance at some running stats. Um Last year, in 118 at bats, he stole eight bases. So if you think about that, that's one. At, that's that's one in every about eight. Uh, one in about every 18 um, at bats, he's getting a stolen base. So plenty of speed. And if you put him at the top of the Indians lineup, if he gets himself on base, draws those walks, that's the one thing I would worry about a little bit. Maybe need to see a little bit more patience. Um, But if he gets on base, this guy could be the stolen base leader. Um, And he has enough 
pop in his bat, not to hit home runs, but to kind of get things all over the field. Uh, the Mets were also grooming him for power because that's what the Mets do. Uh, but he is not a power hitter. The Indians are going to groom him to be more of a contact hitter, uh, help kind of with his natural talent, which is sprayed to all sorts of fields, find those holes, think more like of an Ichiro type player, get hits, get on base, get over, steal the base. Um, so more of a small ball guy. So definitely, definitely Andres Jimenez, this, the situation he's in with the Indians, he's going to have a lot of leash, should be a very interesting player to watch. That was the prize of the fan, uh, of the Francisco Lindor trade for the Indians in his rookie card will be in series one. So smart investors may get in in early and watch that card appreciate, especially if the Indians figure out how to stay in contention in that AL Central. Then we have Mr. Nick Madrigal of the White Sox. He's a second baseman for them. Here's your three reasons to believe. First of all, one thing to note. He is coming off offseason surgery. He played through it last year, had the surgery in October. Um, as recently as a couple days ago, has been back on the field doing baseball activities. So he should definitely be ready for opening day. So the injury concerns should be behind him. Um, while he was in the majors in 2020, he hit a paltry 340 in his first MLB stint. Um, and why did he do that? Well, he has a 70 uh, hit scouting report ranking, which is one of the best rankings you can get. He's one of the best pure hitters and defenders in the game. That's how he's always been as a prospect. He's part of that White Sox nucleus that where they have just been churning out fantastic prospects um, for the last few years now. And Nick Madrigal is basically the next guy up in that. He had a fantastic stint in 2020. It's a young team. It's a competitive team. They should be getting a lot of hype on the south side of Chicago. And Nick Madrigal should be sitting there right up the middle of that infield, raking, 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 and should find himself moving up the batting order as the season goes on. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, when he's surrounded by all of this phenomenal young core, you've got Luis Robert, you've got Eloy Jimenez, um, you've got Jose Abreu, you, uh, you've got so many players that could be coming up, Andrew Vaughn. When you're surrounded by that and all those players are good, it provides more opportunity to get some of those running stats that translate into cards going up in the card hobby. So Nick Madrigal, another person we should be chasing in 2021 Tops Series 1. Finally, we have Mr. Jake Cronenworth of the Padres. He's a second baseman. Here's your three reasons to believe. First of all, had a 354 on base percentage in 2020, which is very consistent with his 375 on base percentage in five major uh, minor league seasons. So as he got up to the majors, you saw a little bit of a dip, but not too much, almost significantly insignificant. Uh, uh, statistically insignificant. Uh, so I believe that you'll actually see his on-base percentage go up. And 354 to begin with is a fantastic on-base percentage. Why is he on-base so much? Well, when you have a 9 uh, walk to, uh, to 15K ratio, that shows a patient, a patient plate approach that means you're going to get high contact, low strikeouts. Um, you're going to be walking as much as you're striking out or close to it. So you get on base a lot. And when you get on base, good things happen. Finally, he's in a low pressure situation. Yes, he's on a very good Padres team, but he doesn't need to carry the team. He's got bigger stars on the team. You've got Tatis, you've got Machado in the spotlight. So he gets to sit there kind of being the third guy, um, maybe the glue of the team a little bit. Uh, he, you can be patient with him, but he in 2020 was just absolutely phenomenal. When he came up, everyone was just amazed with what he was able to do in his limited time in the major. So Jake Cronenworth, another person we're going to be targeting in top series one. However, there are two rookies that I am going to suggest avoiding. Who are those? Let's dig right in. Number one, Joe Adele for the Angels. It pains me to say this. I am an Angels fan. I am a Joe Adele PC collector. However, my list criteria did say 
what cards are going to appreciate from the time of the release down through to the end of the season. I do not believe Joe Adele is going to be one of those cards. Personally, I'm still going to PC him because I do PC him. But if you were into card investing, I don't believe Joe Adele on a short-term investment for the 2021 season is going to be a good idea. And here's why. I'm going to give you three reasons to avoid him. First of all, Joe Madden, the manager of the Angels, has already stated he's going to start the season in the minors, which I, I believe he should as well. If the player's in the minors, even if he has his rookie card, that is not going to do anything for his card value. Second of all, when we look at his stat line from 2020, uh, it shows that he needs more time to develop. It is such an abysmal stat line. I don't want to say it out loud, but when you see the stat that you see on screen, that is not a major league baseball player's stat line. So Joe Adele has a ton of talent, but still needs more time to develop that talent. That's what the minors are for. That's where he should be. Finally, when we look at his K ratio, over the course of three minor league seasons, it was already a little bit of an issue, striking out 28% of the time. But when they brought him up for major league pitching, it ballooned all the way up to 44%. So he needs to work on his patient. He needs to work on, on finding his pitch. He needs to get that rate down. He's had three seasons to do it. I do not believe that Joe Adele is going to be a bust. However, if you are a collector, don't buy into the Joe Adele hype. <clears throat> he is... All, oh, he's going to be all over on the boxes. You're going to see him all over the place because they've used Joe Adele to pitch Series 1. However, a card I would actually recommend to stay away from, and it pains me to say it, my second card to avoid, player to avoid, is going to be Mr. Joey Bart of the Giants. He is their catcher. And uh, a little bit more obvious, I think, why I would pick Joey Bart. But here's my three reasons to avoid him. First of all, most obvious, I do think he's going to start the season in the minors. Buster Posey did not play in 2020 due to the COVID um, outbreak, so he opted out of the 2020 season, but he will be back in 2021. So Buster Posey, at the end of his career, you may not see, this may be his last season, so it may be a going away tour for Buster Posey, which means that blocks Joey Bart from even playing in the first place, or and even if he is at the major league level, at the very end, best he'll be playing one or two times a week and I don't believe that the Giants will allow that to happen they're going to get him the reps in the minors second of all same thing as Joe Adele a way 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 too high strikeout ratio at 39 percent at the big league level last year so he's got to work on that you got got to be more patient and then the more worrisome thing that I have for Joey Bart he is 24 years old um, by the time the end of the season starts, he will be pushing 25. Uh, he has considerable minor league experience. His numbers have been good in the minor leagues, but nothing that you would say is transcendent. A very offensive-minded catcher and a good defensive catcher as well. But I think the ceiling for Joey Bart is actually getting defined here a little bit. Do I think that he's going to go on to a Hall of Fame career? I do not. Do I think he could be a great a catcher for the Giants after Buster Posey? Sure. But do I think he's on the Buster Posey level? Probably not. So as we start thinking about long-term investments and even short-term investments, Joey Bart, someone I actually think I'm going to steer clear of a little bit here in 2021 Top Series 1. So with that, we have eight rookies that you can chase. We've got two rookies that I think you should avoid. And if you liked this video, please be sure to throw over to first, hit that like button for me. And be sure to subscribe because we do all sorts of card investing advice. We're going to be doing set guides and reviews for all of the big sets in 2021 coming up. Got a lot of exciting things that are coming up on the One Cent Sports Cards a YouTube channel. If you are into collecting advice, if you want to know more about the hobby, you want to be more, in, uh, more educated about the hobby, this is the place you want to be. So be sure to subscribe. Hit that bell so you get notified when these videos come out. And as always, guys, I hope you are having fantastic luck on your personal pack polls. I hope you guys enjoy ripping 2021 Top Series 1 as much as I will. And until it comes out, I hope you are being good to your family, to your friends, and to your neighbors. And until next time, take care.